Good evening, everyone. We will get started in just a minute. I uh, just want to take a second to let everybody make their way in for our evening's webinar. All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our seventh Community Climate Forum, Avian Conservation and Climate Change. My name is Lisa Ligis, and as always, I will be your host and moderator tonight. I am a conservation education liaison at the zoo and co-chair of the zoo's climate change, sorry, climate communication committee. We just changed our name. Um, before I introduce our presenter, I want to first give a quick overview of how this webinar will work. First, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared at stlzoo.org slash climate change, the same page where probably many of you registered for the webinar. Because this is a webinar, we are unable to see or hear you, but our goal tonight is to engage with you, hear your thoughts, and answer your questions. We will be monitoring the Q&A and the chat. Please put your questions in the Q&A box and any thoughts or discussion points in the chat. Please remember to be respectful and courteous to our presenter, panelists, and each other. And please keep your questions and thoughts relevant to the presented topic. If someone is unable to follow these protocols, their comment or question will be removed and they themselves may be removed entirely from the webinar. Our presenter will also leave as much time as possible at the end of her presentation to address questions and discussion points with our panelists. So now, without further ado, let's get started. Our distinguished presenter tonight is Amanda Bender, the zoological manager with our bird department. Take it away, Amanda. All right, thank you so much, Lisa. I'll go ahead and share my screen so we can get started. Okay, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm really excited to chat with you all and talk a little bit about my experiences um, through our wild care centers and some important impacts that climate change is having um, on the species related to these centers. So, first of all, very basically, I think um, a lot of time many people will think of climate change as synonymous with global warming. And that is certainly part of the story. Um, but what also needs to be realized and thought about is that climate change's impacts um, are also on climatic events like hurricanes, droughts, typhoons, um, El Nino and La Nina events. So many of these things are normal cyclical events that, that happen um, on a a regular basis, but climate change is causing the intensity and the frequency of many of these events to increase over time. And that is uh, mainly what we'll be, be talking about today as it relates to our wild care centers. Um, so the St. Louis Zoo Wild Care Institute supports 17 wild care centers across the entire planet. Um, so we're involved in conservation of endangered species from zebras in Africa to hellbenders right here in Missouri. Um, so we have a lot of impact all over the world. Um, through the bird department, I've been fortunate enough to be involved with two of those wild care centers. Um, and we'll talk about both of those today. Uh, first, I'll share some information about how climate change can affect the species that we're working with in the Center for Conservation in Puta San Juan, Peru. Um, through this wild care, we support conservation of humble penguins um, by supporting a breeding reserve at Punta San Juan. We also support studies um, and data collection um, through a humble penguin census, which we've been participating in since 2007. And we also support community education in the region, in Peru. So just to kind of picture where this is on the map. So you see the United States um, up above us. So we're way down on the west coast of South America in Peru. 
Um, and at Punta San Juan, it's actually the largest breeding site of humble penguins. So that's why it's important that um, a reserve was established to help protect the birds as well as other animals that use that space. So it's in the southern half of Peru, right on the end of, of this nice little peninsula. So you can see the green area there is the reserve itself at Punta San Juan, or sometimes we refer to it as PSJ. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, this wild care center supports census data collection on humble penguins. So we've been collecting this data yearly since 2007. I was fortunate enough to participate in that census work in 2017, 2018, and 2019. So what that kind of looks like is uh, small teams of biologists, including myself, pictured here, along with uh, Patty McGill, who's formerly um, at Dallas Zoo. We are visiting the molting site of humble penguins with Peruvian colleagues often um, out in the field. Mostly these molting sites are out on small islands off the coast of Peru, um, but there are a few mainland sites like the site at the reserve at PSJ. We're often visiting these sites by boat and we're counting by hand through binoculars to get a physical count of, of how many birds we're seeing. Um, and this is just kind of a snapshot every year um, the idea is that we're catching them during the molting season where many of the birds are not out at the ocean for it, in the ocean foraging and, and eating fish. They're up on land kind of huddled together in a group while they're going through their natural molting process. So that's the best time to kind of get our eyeballs on them and do the census. <clears throat> so El Ninos can impact this coastal ecosystem of Peru. Um, again, an El Nino is a, is a normal cycle. It does happen typically every two to seven years, somewhere in that range. Um, but in the past several decades, they have been stronger and way more frequent. And what happens is the waters um, are warmed and pushed towards the, the west coast of Peru um, in, and in central and throughout South America. Um, and those warmer waters are causing changes in that system. The fisheries there um, are going deeper and, and more towards the cold water. So it's more difficult for a lot of the birds like humble penguins and other animals that are relying on those fisheries to reach. So that is one of the, the main impacts. So again, the frequency and intensity of these El Nino events is increasing over time. That's what this, um, table or this graph is showing us and you can see there's a distinct shift kind of in the 70s where all of a sudden they're really starting to pick up in frequency and intensity and intensity being how warm the waters are getting um, during each El Nino event. And what's important to realize here that there are many layers to the impact of what an El Nino event will do to this kind of region of the world. Um, they are, like I mentioned, causing the fisheries to kind of decline. Uh, the fish are, are going deeper into colder waters where, where the humble penguins aren't able to get them, um, as well as the entire coastal ecosystem, including several other species of seabirds, sea lions, et cetera. Uh, the drop in fisheries impacts the economies in this region that are relying on fish for human use and consumption. Um, another important layer that El Ninos can factor into an impact is that um, another natural resource that the Peruvians are relying on in, in these regions is bird guano or bird droppings. Um, so if the birds aren't there to leave behind the guano because of the fishery decline, because of the warmer temps of an El Nino event, the guano harvesting uh, portion of their economy is also suffering. So the El Nino events, um, the impacts are, are multi-layered. And I just wanted to show you this photo to kind of try to give you an idea that these waters are historically extremely abundant. Um, the Humboldt Current, right along the west side of South America is very cold and nutrient rich and brings with it tons and tons of fish, which supports high productivity of the fish, such as anchoveta that the Humboldts are eating a lot of, um, which in turn supports 
an amazing amount of marine life in this region. So pictured here is just a molting colony of humble penguins on top of that section of the island. And again, more than humble, these waters are supporting other seabirds like ecoterns, brown pelicans, millions of, of guanai cormorants, um, South American sea lions. And I have a short video to show you um, just to kind of give you an, an idea of the abundance of these birds in this region. Millions of seabirds. And you can see some sea lions off to the right of that image as well. Um, so while these systems have evolved with normal El Nino events kind of throughout time and can rebound back to healthy levels over time, you can kind of imagine how repeated blows can start to impact the resilience and numbers of this coastal fauna. So these are a few photos from the census um, that I did in 2017. So this is a site called Pachacama, kind of a, a really cool like cave site. So if you look closely inside, you can see hundreds of little penguins um, standing and molting all along the shore um, inside that cave. So in 2017, we counted 601 penguins at this site. Um, in 2018, there was an El Nino event. So when we went back in 2019, we could actually see some of these changes in a lot of the census data that we were recording just comparing two years back to back. Um, so this is the same site in 2019. Um, we only counted 182 penguins at the site. And again, the El Nino came through in 2018 and 2019 and the birds were hit pretty hard that year. Um, so we were seeing a lot of drop in several of our sites. So again, another important site that we count every year is Santa Rosa. It's this big, beautiful kind of plateaued island. Um, in 2017, we counted 1,700 penguins there. In 2019, there were only 528, so a significant decrease. Um, there are almost no penguins in this photo from 2019. It might be very difficult to see. Everything that you're seeing here is pretty much all guanai cormorants. Um, but if you can imagine that entire scene completely flipped in 2017, it would have been covered with penguins. Um, just from our experience in the other year. Um, so this acknowledges surely that um, this experience was just one snapshot and the census was just one little piece of data um, from this particular site and all the other sites that we, that we visit each year. Um, but this data, I just wanna emphasize, correlates really strongly with overall trends in the region from fisheries and other biological data on the effects of El Nino's in this region. Um, this paired with the information uh, that shows that El Nino events are, are becoming more frequent and more intense is, the, is one of the big concerns for the species in this region as it relates to climate change. Um, and just wanted to mention also our total count for all the sites that we visited in 2017 was 10,426 penguins. In 2019, following that El Nino, we physically counted only 500 or 5,642 birds. So it's a pretty, pretty big drop that was noticeable even in our, even in our work. So what now? Like what does this tell us? Um, tells us that the census data is important. It's important to monitor the humble penguin population over time, excuse me, so we can follow the trends in the population. Um, this data can also help drive support for conservation and protection of critical nesting and molting sites like Punta San Juan. Um, and here is an image of two of the guards that, that um, are living and protecting on one of the guano islands and helping to protect the birds there. Um, further than that, um, just helping to be an advocate and, and learn more about um, how climate can impact species across the globe is, is really important. So I appreciate that you're all here learning a little bit more about it tonight. So next we'll kind of switch gears and I'm going to share with you a little bit about um, how climate change can impact and, and even ways that I've seen climate impact um, uh, species in the Center for Avian Conservation in the Pacific Islands. Um, so through the bird department, I was able to be involved with translocation through this wild care 
in 2018 and 2019. And we're also gearing up for our next translocation um, again in 2022, we're, which we're really excited about. It took a little break with COVID and everything, but we're getting ready to get back out there in the field. Um, so this wild care center focuses on bird species in the Pacific Islands. Uh, and supports that conservation work through translocation, like I mentioned, um, also through supporting wild populations by rearing them in human care when, when needed. We do have a few species um, of Pacific Island birds, several species actually, that we do participate in species survival plans um, and breeding programs here at the zoo um, in conjunction with uh, support from other ACA institutions. And we also support community education there in the Northern Mariana Islands. So kind of shifting to a different part of the globe. If you imagine you're going west and you know where Hawaii is, just keep on going west for a while until you're just above Australia. And that's kind of where the Northern Mariana Islands are. And specifically, our work has primarily focused on translocation um, moving birds from Saipan. So if you if you look down at the bottom, you see the big island is Guam. Hop up a couple islands, um, and you'll see the island of Saipan, and also some translocations from Tinian um, to other un, uninhabited islands in the chain. Um, so why are translocations even important? Let's backtrack just a little bit. Um, so back during World War II. The brown tree snake was accidentally introduced into that island chain onto the big island of Guam. Um, it's an invasive species and it didn't have any natural predators, so it, its population just exploded on the island. Um, it is an arboreal species, so it, it's climbing trees um, really, really well, and it was able to eradicate all of Guam's endemic bird species. Now there are only two species that still exist and only in the care of zoos. And that's the Guam rail and the Guam kingfisher, which we do have here at the St. Louis Zoo and are proud to work with um, that species for its conservation. Um, so this brown tree snake is a devastating threat that is constantly kind of lingering, um, a threat to Saipan's bird species because it's, it's really pretty close. It's just a couple islands down on that island chain. So in partnership with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, an, organization, an organization called Pacific Bird Conservation, as well as other AZA institutions um, who partner in this important work, we translocate or move endemic bird species from Saipan and sometimes Tinian to other islands in the chain. Um, so that they may set up kind of assurance population somewhere else so that we know they'll be safe if the brown tree snake were to ever make its way to Saipan, potentially. So what does translocation look like? So what it looks like first is we'll mist net the birds. Um, and a mist net is a, a super fine net that we span through a little section of the forest, kind of like a volleyball net. The birds can't see the net, and so when they bounce into it, they're gently captured and we can remove them safely. Um, then we'll move them to a temporary holding room where um, they will get a species appropriate diet two to four times a day. They also receive veterinary exams upon arrival and are able to receive vet care during their stay if needed. So if at any point they are deemed not fit to make the translocation journey, we will just go ahead and re-release them right where we caught them. Um, then once um, the translocation day comes, we'll load up the crates with the birds in them onto a boat or sometimes a helicopter and move them to the designated island for release there. So this is um, a few, these are a few images of a transport day. So we're moving the um, boxes from the large boat onto the island to be carried up into the forest to release the birds there. Um, so here I am on the left hand side waiting with the birds in the shade for more hands to help carry all those boxes up into the forest where they were released on the target island. And these photos are from 2019. So how does climate change impact these systems and these birds that we're working with specifically in the Northern Mariana Islands? 
Um, remember, we're talking here about a lot of impacts related to the increase of climatic events. So here in this region, they're experiencing typhoons, again, semi-regularly. A typhoon is basically a big tropical storm that happens in the Pacific Ocean. Um, when we have big storms like this from the Atlantic Ocean or in the Western Hemisphere, we call them hurricanes. So it's basically a, a giant hurricane. Um, so Super Typhoon U2 hit in October of 2018, um, right after we had been there in, Jan or in April and May of 2018. Um, U2 was equivalent to a Category 5 hurricane. It was a significant storm and it went directly over Saipan. As you can see, that arrow is right where Saipan is in that tiny island chain. Um, it was the worst storm to hit U.S. soil since 1935, um, and speeds, the wind speeds were over 180 miles per hour. So it's really devastating, not only to the forest tracks, but also to the infrastructure on the island. People were out of power for a long time, um, a lot of structural damage. Um, so scientists are noting that super typhoons every year, uh, the average is increasing. And unfortunately, this was also following right behind another super typhoon that happened and hit Saipan in 2015. Um, so they only had a three year span to kind of recover and they were hit really hard again. Um, and a super typhoon just implies that the wind speeds are over 150 miles per hour. So these are significant weather events. So remember, I went in 2018 and 2019, so smack dab in between those, you two hit. Um, so what we are seeing when we came back in 2019 was a lot of damaged forests. So this is what the forest will typically look like, um, the secondary like native forest in Saipan. When we came back in 2019, a lot of it was really damaged. Um, so with the canopy damage, the net sites were very hot and sunny. Uh, which increased our net checks. We had to physically be out there checking to make sure birds weren't caught and just sitting in the sun. Um, it also just reduced the time that we had in a day to safely have the nets open because it just got too hot with no cover. Um, so it made the field work a lot harder on the team um, and more difficult to make sure the birds were not getting overheated. Um, the native fruiting trees like papaya had very low production in the field. Usually we'll go out and we'll harvest papaya um, to feed to the birds in the bird room, because that's the fruit that they're used to eating. So we just continue to feed it to them while they're hanging out with us temporarily before they're moved. But there was basically no papaya available. So we had to rely on different fruit sources. And we were doing everything from frozen blueberries to canned peaches, just trying to make sure we had enough fruit to offer the birds. So we had to get a little creative. Um, we also noted that many of the birds were coming in with just lower body condition scores. And that just kind of means that the, the birds weren't quite as robust. They, they, weren't, um, they didn't have as much weight on them as they had in previous years overall. We were still working really carefully with the vet team to make sure that we still felt confident they were able to make the translocation journey. Um, but we definitely noted that the body condition had kind of dropped following um, the typhoon U2 in 2018. So again, kind of what, what now? I think what this does show is that translocations um, are still important, not only as they relate to the threat of the brown tree snake, but also as they relate to, relate to um, huge storm events like super typhoons. Because if a typhoon hits a particular island really hard, it could really have a huge impact on the species of, of birds and other animals that are there. So having an assurance population on another island, even though it's close, it might, it might fare better um, during some storm system. Um, and again, just advocacy, climate change awareness, just being um, able to kind of understand what our role is um, in climate change and what we can do, even small things day to day, to try to do our part to shift things in the right direction. I think more than ever, we need more advocacy around education and action towards reducing our impacts on climate change. We may not be able to stop a typhoon from wiping out an island just as we can't stop El Nino events in its tracks, but we do have a responsibility to be better stewards of our Earth and all the species on it 
So bit by bit, we've affected this change on our world and our climate. So we, what we need to do now is just bit by bit, do everything we can do to support efforts to slow these negative impacts. So with that, I, I would like to thank you and, and thank um, everyone who has made this work possible. Thank you to the Wild Care Center for Conservation in Puget San Juan. Thank you to the Wild Care Center for Avian Conservation in the Pacific Islands. Thank you also to my boss, curator Ann Tiber and the BIRD team uh, for supporting uh, myself and other staff going out to do this impactful work. And I've listed a few of our partners that work with us on these projects um, below, as well as my email address if you would like to ask any questions or reach out following this presentation. Great, thank you so much, Amanda. That was uh, riveting to say the least. I was glued um, to, to this presentation because it's not only is it fascinating just the work that's going on, but the compounding impacts from climate change on top of the, basically the original issues why the zoo got involved with these species is just, it's just, it's a lot. Yeah. Um, we, we do have a few questions. Um, I do encourage anybody, if you have any other, if you have questions, please throw them in the Q&A. If you have any topics or um, anything that Amanda discussed that you would like us to discuss further, please go ahead and put that in the chat. So um, our questions, some of these go back to um, our penguins, to the Humboldts mm -hmm. and the Punta San Juan region. Um, a couple questions had to do with when you're talking, since the numbers are so dramatically lower, so much lower in just a few years. Um, what are kind of the thoughts or assumptions of what's happening to those penguins? So do do, do scientists, you guys think they're, they're dying? Are they moving? What do you, what are you guys thinking so far? Um, it, it is, it is good to note that humble penguins tend to be um, very sensitive to disturbance. Um, and that's part of the reason why um, like the last photo, I, I had a photo of the guards on the island, on the Guano Island. Those folks are there to help try to um, enforce and deter uh, fishermen from coming really close to the islands and things like that, that, that can really scare the birds. So at certain sites, um, it's possible that things, events like that might have just disturbed that group. And um, if they're disturbed enough, they might just find another spot. Um, but I think the, the, the main concern is that the, the warm waters of El Nino, when they come across, they really just push the fish down and out and, and lower, lower the amount of fish that the Humboldt even have access to. So they're, they're traveling farther, they're foraging farther and farther from their normal kind of foraging ranges to try to find food. And unfortunately, a lot of them do have trouble finding food. And that's probably the main reason why we're seeing such a significant drop after these El Nino events. That's fascinating. And it's it's kind of one of those like, I guess, and unfortunately, time will probably tell at least in the next few years of, you know, where trends continue to go and how things keep changing. Um, we do have a question about the Pacific Island birds. Um, since you're moving them from one place to another, do have you noticed the birds ever using their natural honing abilities to ever try to go back to the island from whence they came? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> so most of these species have pretty small ranges. I mean, they're they're growing up on or living on islands that are pretty small. Like, 40 square miles, 100 square miles. So the islands are really small as it is, and they don't really travel a ton even within the island. Um, so one of the reasons that we that we do physically translocate them is because they they wouldn't disperse themselves. They they wouldn't necessarily island hop on their own. Um, so we kind of have to gather them and, and and drop them onto a new island so that they can start to establish that other population. It's just not part of their natural history to, to travel long distances and migrate. Like a lot of the species that we're used to here migrate huge spans twice a year. These guys are pretty much right where they are and that's 
all they're interested in seeing. So that's a really good question though. And that makes sense. And it's, it's neat to think about, I mean, there's so much like the diversity within bird species, but how depending on that, that, like I said, their home range, what those actual movements look like and being able to get, it's almost like hibernation in bears. Like if they get all the food they need, they don't have to hibernate. If the birds get all they need from this one small area, they're good to go. And yeah. it's an, you know, an island that I'm assuming has weather pretty similar all year round. And so yeah, it, yeah. it's a tropical understand. island. So the weather is, is pretty consistent year round. Um, the, the trees are fruiting more or less year round. So it's, it's pretty much the same every day for them almost. Nice. <laughs> Now we've had a few questions going back to penguins. Sorry, I'm bouncing all over the place for you. Um, going back to penguins, we've had a few questions that I was able to answer a couple of them about what the guano is used for and um, how the guano kind of factors into the original um, conservation issue that the zoo was really interested in right. working on and supporting. Um, and I think, let me see. Well, we have a visitor. Um, a participant from Munich, Germany. So hello. Oh, Basically. wow, welcome. Um, that's awesome. Um, but there, she kind of went, this person kind of went into a little more detail on their question, um, whether or not it's still a factor for these birds of whether or not there's a trade in the fertilizer. Is it something that needs to be uh, stopped, banned um, and what that impact has on top of climate change? Yeah, so going back like a few decades, um, the guano harvest was one of the, the kind of first things that helped us kind of get involved to um, helping to support conservation of humble penguins because um, the guano on these island sites especially were just getting stripped down to the rock super frequently. So the disturbance was really a, a problem for the penguins. But physically not having that guano to burrow down into and nest in was, was a huge problem. Um, so once that was kind of identified, um, the, there was a, a shift to more sustainable management of guano. Um, so the zoo is supporting sustainable guano harvests, harvest so that um, you know, a site may not be harvested for 10, 15 years at a time. But then they have a, you know, a, a, a harvest year, a concerted effort to go in there, harvest um, a sustainable amount, and then pull back out and, and not mess with it again uh, for a long time. And in many cases, the, the humbles are contributing to the, the guano, but it's many of the other bird species that are, that are really piling on a lot of the supply of the guano, like the guani cormorants. Uh, boobies, pelicans, things like that, that are also using these islands as their rookery and nesting sites. Um, so they're sitting there really close together and just putting out tons of guano. Um, it's a super, super abundant system. There are millions of seabirds there. Um, so yeah, stripping the guano repeatedly is causing uh, problems for humble penguins as well as the other birds, just not allowing them to set up and, and nest. Um, so drop in all the, the guano producing species equal to a drop in guano, which was a huge problem. So now there are much more sustainable kind of regulations regarding the guano harvest. It is still harvested and it is still used um, as part of their economy um, as a natural resource for fertilizer. Um, but it's, it's, it's much more regulated. Um, and much more refined to be more sustainable, not only for the guano supply, but for the birds that are there producing the guano. Yeah, and that really speaks to kind of, as you mentioned, when you were talking about the El Nino events and how the fish, are, the fish impacts are hitting everybody, not just yeah. penguins and other sea lions and other coastal animals, but people as well. And, you know, already having that, especially with the Wild Care Center and what a wonderful job the Wild Care Center does with that holistic approach of this ecosystem contains more than just one species. And it also, you know, there's people there too. So addressing, you know, all of those different factors is just remarkable. Yeah. Really great. Challenging. You know, right. Yeah, definitely challenging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
All right, so we had, um, okay, another question about the El Nino. Um, do you know if the El Nino effects, is it, and I know your map kind of showed how it really does kind of just slam right into that area. Um, mm -hmm. Are there other, like some more Southern penguins, like more Antarctic penguins, that you know or not, um, if they're also, if the El Nino effects are also down there? Um, well, once you get down into Chile or Chile, um, you know, the Magellanic penguins kind of start creeping in real close to the Humboldt penguin range on the west side. Um, but I would say they're probably the most likely species to be impacted as well by specifically El Nino events. Other climate change and other current changes impact um, other penguin species, certainly. Um, but I'd say the Magellanics, since they're so close to that range, are probably the other species that are hit hardest by El Ninos and the in increase in frequency and uh, intensity of El Nino events. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, and it's, and that's the thing with, you know, one of the reasons it's great to have you presenting today and how climate change has these global impacts. So what people are, you know, it doesn't, it's not what the Marianas Islands are doing to contributing to climate change that is causing, <laughs> you know, it's global and it's, you know, what we're all doing. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, going back to the Marianas Islands, I'm curious, we had a question, um, if each island's ecosystem is unique, somewhat like the Galapagos, or are they all pretty similar? In that region, they're all pretty similar. Um, and the Department of Fish and Wildlife helps us do kind of a habitat assessment before any animals would ever be translocated. So they're looking to make sure that um, they have appropriate fruiting trees um, for food and things like that, and to see what other species might be on the island already, if there are, um, just to make sure we're not setting um, that population up you know, for failure. We wanna make sure they have what they need to be successful and sustainable long-term. Um, so Department of Fish and Wildlife helps to do a lot of those assessments beforehand, but many of those islands are pretty much, um, pretty much exactly the same, which is handy because they're all kind of scattered all throughout the South Pacific. Um, but we, there are measures in place to make sure that they're suitable before we decide to move the species there. Nice. And speaking of um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, is the brown tree snake being eradicated from any of the islands? Okay. That is a really great question. So the brown tree snake is a tricky creature. Uh, it's very prolific. Um, and there have been several, um, you know, different management strategies to try to curb their population and bring them, bring them down to a, a place where they could functionally be eradicated. Um, unfortunately, that's really difficult to do. Um, they're breeding in such huge numbers and they're fairly small and, and abundant everywhere. It, it, it's, it's a bigger problem than, it sounds so great. Like, couldn't we just go kill all those snakes and just put the birds back. But I, I, I'm trying, I'm grasping at the words to explain to you how abundant they are and just how difficult that will be. Um, some of the measures that they have tried um, are like uh, the acetaminophen mouse drops. So acetaminophen is a, a drug that we take, you know, Tylenol. Um, and it's totally fine for us, but for the snakes, it's actually lethal. Um, so they would basically dose mice, dead mice, um, with acetaminophen and drop them all over the island with the hopes that the snakes would pick them up and die and that they could control the population that way. It works some of the time, but it's not effective enough to bring the population down to zero when a, I think this like stats are like a female brown tree snake can have something like close to 500 young in a clutch or something absolutely absurd. So they're they're just explosively taking off whenever they have the opportunity. Um, so it's hard. 
There is a small site on Guam um, at the Air Force Base there that they have been able to kind of partition off with snake barrier uh, fences and things. So there's kind of a, a site there that's a little more snake proof. Um, so they're kind of playing with ways like if that could be expanded over time, um, but they're, they're very good at climbing. They're very good at figuring out even like safety nest box kind of situations. They figure out how to get in and get the birds. So it's a tricky problem. I think it's still worth investigating and a lot of um, effort is going into investigating um, how to get rid of the brown tree snake. But um, I think there may be other ways to get some of those species onto other islands that might be more effective at this point, unfortunately. They're just, they're really tricky. <laughs> So one of the species you mentioned that is hanging in there um, is the Guam kingfisher. Yeah. And um, so I had kind of two questions along those lines. Um, the first one is, do you think the captive population, so the, the population in human care um, and in zoos, um, will ever be support reintroduction or is it kind of just to make sure they don't go extinct? That's a great question. And um, a, a question that I think is very exciting to finally have like a, a glimmer of hope and a, a really good answer to. So um, Department of Fish and Wildlife and IUCN, as well as AZA zoos that are that are holding the species currently, um, is working together to to form plans to reintroduce this species into the wild, not on Guam, but on a, a similar um, a similar island that would be. Uh, appropriate for for their release. Um, so that plan, while while we're you know reaching for the stars, takes a lot of steps and a lot of planning to make sure that you know the 160 Guam kingfishers that are existing now today, like we need to do well by them to make sure that uh, their offspring are successful there. So what that process will likely kind of look like and what they're planning on is having eggs um, that are laid in AZA institutions sent to a, a secondary kind of training site where the chicks will be reared. Um, they'll be kind of, uh, if you've ever grown seedlings inside and you know you have to harden off your plants before you can plant them outside, it's kind of the same steps that they're hoping to take with the Guam Kingfisher. So these eggs will be sent to a secondary island site um, where they'll be in outdoor enclosures, they'll be able to, you know, naturally forage and catch lizards and, and um, have appropriate predator responses and things like that. Um, and then they would be moved from that site to the destination island um, that they're, they're still kind of working out where is appropriate and, and identifying the best place. Um, one cool thing that we've been involved with here at St. Louis um, in conjunction with um, the Zoological Society of London, there was an investigator there who was doing a study um, and other ACA institutions who have Guam Kingfishers currently, um, they were investigating radio transmitter att attachment methods um, because once those birds are put out on that new island, we're gonna want to know where they're going and um, you know, mark their, their their movements and their territories, where they're hunting, who they're pairing up with, and and get a glimpse of all those behaviors because this will be the first time they're back out in the wild. Um, so we here uh, put transmitters of a couple different style types on some of our unpaired birds just to see how they did with them over time, make sure there wasn't too much like wear of their feathers, make sure their weights didn't drop or anything unusual um, based on those attachment types. Um, what we did find is um, some of the attachment types didn't work as well for bomb king kingfishers as they probably work on other species of birds. Uh, kingfishers are, they're very, you know, spunky. They've got a lot of grit um, and they also have a pretty strong bill even for a, a small species. So they were able to rip those transmitters off and, and work on the little straps that are attaching them over time. So there are a couple 
of those attachment methods that we found out pretty quickly probably weren't going to work um, and certainly weren't going to be something we could rely on long term once we eventually move them back um, into their 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 new wild home um, but that was a really cool kind of building block project to be a part of and work on um, as we prepare slowly to actually get this species back out into the wild so it's really exciting work <laughs> That's amazing. And, you know, it is, has to be challenging when you have an animal that can reach its back and, yes. you know, pretty much reach everywhere. Um, but, I mean, we could do an entire webinar at some point just on like reintroduction and what that looks like, because it's, it's never as simple as just taking an animal from an human care and just placing it out, you know, in a new habitat. So, um, yeah, that's incredible. And it's, fantastic to hear that there's a lot of promise there. Yeah, we're yeah. very hopeful. Now, going back to the Guam Kingfishers, and then you said the Guam Rail is the other bird that is hanging in there. Um, have they noticed any reason in particular why that those two are, are able to hang in there with the brown tree snake? Are they just too big for the snakes to eat or? So, thank you for bringing this question up and helping me clarify. So those two species no longer exist on Guam. They are okay, all, they're good, all gone. Yeah, unfortunately. But gotcha. they do persist um, in human care um, only. Gotcha. So okay. we're, we're glad that we were able to, to save those from the brown tree snake kind of eradication. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And then Frank had a question. Um, are there still problems with tourists in the area around? So this is uh, Paracas, which I'm, is maybe in Saipan? Uh, in Peru. In Peru, okay. The tour, okay. So are there any issues with tourists in that region um, that just in terms of disturbing the penguins since you mentioned they're so sensitive to? Definitely. Um, Paracas is a, a very touristy kind of area. Um, I don't have like any specific stats or increase, decrease kind of feelings or information about what's been going on in Paracas recently, but they do do a paid boat tour out to one of the islands that general public can just go to and pay to, to see penguins kind of thing. Um, so most of the islands that we're visiting, visiting typically to do our census work, all of those spaces, we have to have permits and all those things to even get close. Um, so Brock is being a more touristy area. It wouldn't surprise me if some of that is still kind of persisting, but I don't have a great gauge as to like better or worse than previous. I do know that it seems like Paracas and its tourist area is kind of growing and getting more popular. So it could, you know, we could infer that maybe it has potential to maybe be a little bit worse, but I don't have a great answer for that. Sounds good. Um, all, one last question about Peru, and then we've got some exciting questions about local birds um, to see what kind of efforts we can do there. Um, so a question came in about artificial nesting. So, and for specifically for the penguins, um, are those, are we able to do that or support any of that um, in Peru? Yes, um, we've done a fair bit of um, artificial nesting nest box um, support for um, Puja San Juan, kind of testing out different styles and figuring out which materials they can be made of to make sure that the, the insides aren't getting too hot for the birds, because um, it is a desert climate and it can get very hot during the day. Um, so yeah, we've done quite a bit of um, artificial nest box support for, for the humble penguins over time. Very cool. And yeah, before we moved on to um, native birds and the questions we have there, because um, there's a lot of cool work going on with those guys, um, I just want to encourage everybody, you know, climate change is big, it's global, it's affecting all kinds of people, all kinds of ecosystems. And Amanda just gave us some pretty sobering examples of what's really good, what is going on in some of the areas that we work. And so I encourage everyone to really think about, you know, 
community solutions, community-based solutions. Um, you know, we've talked a lot in our webinars about all kinds of different solutions. Um, so I definitely encourage you to rewatch a lot of those if you're really seeking out any um, opportunities to find solutions. So what we do here and the big actions we can take here do have global impacts, um, which is pretty incredible. But switching back to local, do you see any effects of climate change on birds in Missouri? So I know we've got a whole songbird initiative. Um, so yeah. That's a really great question. Um, off the top of my head, I don't have any great like pivotal examples of climate change impacts. Um, though I have no doubt that that there is happening, um, especially, you know, the birds as they're migrating are cued in. So not only they length, but they're arriving at sites because they're evolutionarily, they evolutionarily have learned that once they get there, it's going to be abundant with, you know, sap flow or insects or whatever the case may be. So climate change can definitely impact a lot of those things. Or like they get there and the bugs are already done, you know, they're they're already moving on or they've done their breeding flights or whatever the insects are doing, you know. So I think there are definitely probably things happening. Um, I don't have any great like examples for native birds, but climate change impacts everything. Um, so yeah, and I think we yeah, I think the food chain connection is probably one of the more apparent or a little easier to see or see kind of creeping up, like you said, with um, the way things are blooming differently and the way animals react to that. And then it just, you know, works its way up the chain for sure. Yeah. Um, also with local birds, we have someone, Andrew is doing his capstone project on feral cats in his university's area. And um, he was wondering if the zoo has studied invasive feral cats affecting bird populations. So kind of drawing a parallel between the tree snakes in Saipan and cats um, here. Absolutely. Um, cats are wonderful domesticated animals and lots of us have them as pets. Um, so I certainly don't wanna down on cats too much, but outdoor cats, uh, we have found to really be a huge problem for native birds. Um, they unfortunately predate or kill more than 2 billion birds every year. Um, so they are the like number one killer of, of birds, unfortunately, um, here in the US. Um, so we have done a lot of work trying to kind of just educate and advocate for if you have a pet cat, wonderful. We think that's great, but um, just kind of asking people to consider keeping those guys inside. Um, I think it's, you know, culturally a very popular thing to have outdoor cats or have barn cats and things like that. Um, but those cats are predatory um, of all sorts of small animals, but especially small birds and songbirds. Um, so they can be really devastating um, to songbird populations in North America. Yeah, and I've actually seen all kinds of very creative ways to still get your cat time outside yeah. without them being able to predate on birds. Um, so I highly recommend uh, people checking those out if you <laughs> if this is a, a topic that interests you, because there's some, and even like zoo employees that have cats, I know plenty of them that could find all kinds of creative ways so their yeah. cats can still be cats without decimating bird populations. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and it's much safer for the cats as well. Right. Um, I think people don't realize the dangers and diseases and threats mm -hmm. that cats face by being an outdoor cat. Um, so considering those for your cat's health as well, I think is important. For sure. Um, someone asked, and this is a really awesome question. Um, are there any citizen science opportunities for this work that you've been talking about? So participating in joining or participating in these projects? Oh, like specific to these wild care projects? That's yes. a really great question. Um, I, in 
in those regions, we do a lot of community like activities and, and outreach and things, but that might be something that we could investigate in the future, how to help make a direct connection with our community here in those spaces. Um, there's not something kind of already established, but I think that's a really cool idea. Well, and do you know of any local that might be a little more accessible? Because I might sure. like Carrie travels with you. I know it's a lot of work to get to, <laughs> to get to Saipan or to get to Peru. Sure, um, sure. Locally, are there to kind of get people a little more engaged with their backyard birds? Absolutely. Um, There's a lot that we can do um, or folks can do locally. Um, there are several different um, like bird counts that are encouraged kind of throughout the year. There's the great backyard bird counts in the spring. And there's also the Christmas counts. Um, usually if you check out the Audubon website, um, the Audubon St. Louis um, chapter, they'll have a lot of information about how you can sign up. Um, and basically uh, the this year, they shifted the great backyard bird um, count to be just on your phone through the Cornell um, bird app. So if you saw a bird, you could just do it right there on your phone and say, I saw a bird. And even if you aren't sure what the bird is, that app actually helps you kind of walk through based on what the bird was doing, where you saw it, what's the general size of the bird, you know, is it mm -hmm. barrel size, rob size, crow size, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it can help you identify and then you say, yep, that's my bird. And they're collecting all that data um, to, to kind of put towards citizen science projects and just just really good general data collection. Um, if you're a little more involved or interested, you can also participate um, in eBird is, is a, a great online um, kind of uh, birding log where you can check in uh, different locations and what birds you're seeing in different areas, especially right now during spring migration. This is a super fun time to get out there and see what you might see because there are lots of different species migrating um, through our area. We sit mm -hmm. right in this magical place, right in the middle of the country um, called the Mississippi Flyway. Like 60% of species that are migrating across North America are using our flyway. So they're right here in our backyard. And I think that's something that a lot of people maybe don't realize or take it for granted, but there's a lot of really amazing things to see right now. Um, and if you go just a little bit north, um, you'll likely see sandhill cranes and some of the other species that you may not see right here in St. Louis. Um, but you can make a fun day trip out of it and see some cranes and things like that. So this is a really special place and time. But yeah, if you want to get more involved, um, any of those kind of bird counts or check out eBird um, would be a fun place to start. Um, also, just putting out a feeder and seeing what might be encouraged to hang out in your backyard is a really fun and easy way to get involved and, and see, see some birds. Yeah, and that's because it's citizen science, because it is data collection, that contributes to a body of knowledge that will help us answer some of these bigger questions like how are bird movements, populations, how are things changing? And so even doing something like that is a huge step, is a huge action for birds and for this type of data that's gonna help us figure these things out to know what steps, some really specific steps we can take um, and our you know, local governments and whoever can take to help um, preserve and conserve these species. Um, so that's awesome. Yay, and what a great way to end on <laughs> what we can do here and all these great things we can do to help birds all over the world. So. We are just at time, um, so I apologize if we didn't get to your question. Um, feel free, like Amanda shared her email, so feel free to reach out to Amanda. And Amanda, I'm wondering um, when we post, so you'll be posting this um, recording up next week, take look for it next week. I'm wondering if we can throw in our uh, some of the links to some of these citizen science stuff. We yeah, yeah uh, I'd be happy to share those with you. So okay, great. And we'll post that along with the video. Um, so if anybody is interested, you can have find quick access to those. Um, so you can get involved and take some action for birds. All right, well, 
I think we are just at time. Amazing. Well done, everybody. <laughs> I love when everything just cinches up perfectly. So thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Amanda, for your fabulous presentation um, and facilitating our fantastic discussion tonight. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Happy to be here. Great job, Amanda. <laughs> thank you, Frank. <laughs> and thank you to Frank and Wanda for helping navigate all your amazing questions um, and keeping an eye on the chat for us tonight. So everyone, please be on the lookout for information on next month's Community Climate for Forum, which will be held on April 14th at 5.30 p.m. Have a wonderful rest of your evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> Take care. Take care.